quickly start with just a quick round of introductions. I'm Manu, I'm the co-founder of Vama. Um, and just two things, tell us who you are um, and how many number of pivots have you done till now? Hi guys, I'm Ankit Agarwal, uh, founder and CEO of Unstop. Uh, I think we've done two pivots. If they qualify in the definition of the pivots, I think that's also subjective, but yeah, in our journey, it's been two pivots. Uh, hi all, uh, this is Rohit. I'm co-founder and CEO of Smartcoin, now called Olive. So we are a fintech lending startup. Uh, and now I think we've expanded to create a credit-led digital financial platform for the entire emerging India. In terms of pivot, so I think there's definitely one in very, very early days uh, where we shifted the entire business model from something else to what we are doing today. Uh, the second thing, which is not exactly a pivot, but I think more of a market expansion as we've re realized the opportunity is much more massive is uh, to go from credit to now creating an entire uh, financial platform. So I don't know if it qualifies as a pivot, but it could be like one and a half. Uh, the name change is pivot. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> so, so, so then that qualifies, yeah. Everything's pivot. Hi, uh, I'm Saurabh. I'm the founder and CEO of Elo Elo. Uh, Elo Elo is a new age media entertainment platform. So we are the number one live entertainment platform in India. Uh, broadly do creator led live streams, games across vernacular languages, uh, across multiple formats. Uh, so for us, to answer your question, we did one very hard pivot in the first year of our journey, where we went from short video and uh, different tasting content to purely a live platform. Um, and another big one, it wasn't a pivot as such, it was more of a philosophy change, is where we went from pre-revenue to revenue, where we changed our entire model, we launched microtransactions. So yeah, those two journeys, happy to be here, excited. Yeah. Nice, uh, we were an astrology company, we pivoted to a puja company, I don't know if that qualifies for a pivot. Um, so I'll try to keep this as light as I can and guys feel free to jump in. Um, you know, a lot of us are startup founders uh, also here, right? Everyone talks about Zomato, everyone talks about Flipkart. They have pivoted, right? How do early startups know when to pivot and how can we learn from this pivot, right? Like how do, how do you see it? Right, like for them to today do blink it Zomato, right? Like is, right. yeah. Right, so I mean, I think both are really great examples. So like if you look at Zomato, right? So started as a discovery and listing platform at a certain point when they realized that, you know, there's a growing appetite for delivery. So then they obviously ventured into that. Uh, timing was also great because that was a period when uh, the whole internet and smartphone penetration obviously drove a lot of uh, expanding time uh, for, 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 for that market. And obviously with COVID again, then they went into grocery delivery and it was a very timely acquisition of Blinkit. They were obviously, I think, being, you know, I think uh, very, very aggressive into that as well. Uh, similarly, if you take case of Flipkart, right, started as a bookstore, expanded into everything. Uh, then again, at a certain point, did uh, very important strategic acquisitions of uh, Mintra and Jabong to get deep into uh, relatively better economics, fashion, commerce market. And then I think very interestingly, they realized that, you know, this whole payments, uh, digital payments and UPI is going to explode. So what they did with PhonePay is obviously very, very amazing. So like once you put all of them together, right, there are a few things that stick out in my view, uh, which are very, very useful for early stage startups. So one is at the macro level, right? So, and that generally holds true globally, but I think more so for a country like India, which is growing very, very fast with sort of big changes happening every few years. So if you are keeping a good eye on how the macro environment is changing, what are the defining things that are coming into the picture? So 10 years back, it was maybe internet 1.0, uh, seven, eight years back, it was about UPI and then geo effect. Uh, then it obviously became post COVID very fast uh, digitalization. And today maybe it's AI and certain other trends, right? So these trends obviously shape uh, the sectors and companies in very, very different way. So you have to have an eye on how the market trends are changing, what you can do with it. Second thing that I also think is important to build multi-generational companies in particular is uh, you pick sort of a large TAM. That becomes very, very important because what ends up happening over time, once you start going into a certain product or a certain segment, once you learn about it, there are obviously adjacencies that you can pick. So in that sense, uh, having a high potential time obviously helps you to keep discovering or keep iterating. Uh, so, so that's something that you have to do as an early stage founder on the macro side. The second thing, once you've zeroed down on it, uh, 
I think India is historically been a relatively, I think, trust deficit country. Now, obviously, that has given rise to so many brands coming up in every space. So once you've zeroed in the space, you try to make yourself among the top th two, three brands in that space, which helps you to, again, cement your position, gain sort of much higher customer retention, which can obviously help you again propel into different sort of tailwinds uh, as and when they arrive. So that is the second thing. Third thing, which again, uh, which then is more internal, right? So once you have figured all this, are you really capable of actually uh, uh, capturing that uh, a market opportunity? Which I think there are two, three things in my view, right? So again, one, if you are actually basing it a lot on technology and data play, that allows you to handle the scaling complexities as, as in when again these opportunities arrive. So how do you think about that? How do you create a more of an agile and uh, adapting culture inside the company to capitalize, right? Again, Zomato being a case in example, <coughs> apart from these things, when COVID happened, there was obviously a lot of mistrust in terms of whether you can take food deliveries or not. So how they created contactless, how they created again, I think that uh, trust that was obviously very exemplary. So in my view, I think these are the two, three things that obviously early stage startups can keep in mind uh, to make sure they can seize these opportunities in a better way. So thanks. That's super helpful. Aapne bola TAM, do word ek aur TAM, PMF is all we hear, right? Um, so Saurabh and Ankit, right? Like tell us about PMF, right? Like do you guys wake up and say, aaj PMF ho gaya. Like how does, how does a founder know that boss, I've hit PMF? Like does it, does Shark Tank, is Shark Tank PMF, right? Like uh, how does PMF happen? <laughs> Shark Tank is not PMF. <laughs> But I think uh, just uh, just to elaborate on the pivot, I yeah. think uh, where I was going wrong, and I'll, I'll tell you the, and that's why I said that if that qualifies as a pivot, see, in my view, Flipkart as such hasn't taken a pivot. Correct. So if I stick to an e-commerce domain, Snapdeal was a coupons company. Yeah. They become an e-commerce company. Yeah. That's a major pivot. Flipkart from day one was an e-commerce. They expanded from books to pretty much every everything. So that's more like an expansion rather than a pivot in my view. Yep. Yep. Right? And similarly, Zomato did pivot because they were basically an intermediary company or so. So I think that part as founders, we need to be sure in terms of what's pivot and what's general expansion, which I think we, 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 yep. we, we do confuse. Uh, coming to uh, PMF, I think for, for us, uh, the PMF uh, started and in, in the first instance, our, uh, we realized that uh, the before our recent pivot that, that we did in 2021, we were always discussing on the value proposition for the user. Is consumer or user of then we used to be called as dare to compete coming back to the platform on a daily basis weekly basis monthly basis right for, for me i think if i'm increasing those engagements if the person is if we are consistently increasing our dao mouse uh, i know for a fact that i'm able to create some value because of which the same user is coming back again sure. that's one element so basically, whether our users are loving us, whether we are solving their problem, and I think though for us, the metrics were DAOs, MAOs, whether they are increasing or not, and that sort of worked well. Uh, the second aspect was on the, on the customer side in terms of whether we are able to have our repeat customers. So we worked with all the top recruiters, uh, let's say Flipkart, Amazon, Reliance, Tata, Zorda, so. Uh, can they, uh, are they coming back to us every year or every quarter? That's one. Second, I think for PMF also, at least for us, was that in every repeat business, am I able to go deep into their pockets? If I was getting 100 rupees out of a 1,000 rupees pocket share, am I increasing it to 150 or 200? with my expansion because then the PMF is just not my base product but also everything which is ancillary to my base yeah. product are they willing to take up those elements or so or not and I think that was basically the journey that we had in terms of the PMF bit but I mean you may not realize one day that you don't have a PMF but soon you may realize one day that you have a PMF 
इट्स नॉट दैट आज मुझे पी एम एफ अचीव करना है इट्स अ ग्रेजुअल प्रोसेस हम शुरू साल में आता है सालों मतलब मेरे ख्याल से अकल उस चीज के लिए सालों लग गए वंस वी गॉट वॉट इट टेक्स देन इट डिन टेक अस मे बी टू टू थ्री मंथ्स टू गेट दैट राइट we'll talk about the pivot framework and then even yeah. pmf um for pivots right we thought about this very deeply because we went through one ourselves and i had sort of created like a mental model or a framework for this where we felt that there's actually three parts to it there's pivots there's extensions and there's relevancy right? pivot is inspired by something that that there's a quote that i get very inspired by uh, it's a quote by yc which says build stuff that people want right i think everyone's familiar with that, uh, with that they say if you haven't then you shouldn't be ashamed uh, of pivoting very quickly like for example uh, myself as a product manager so when we see it we could understand that the product love is not there we will need to build something which has more long range retention which has better engagement etc so that's the call you take on a hard pivot right on examples of e-commerce and you want to sort of extend to more use cases like if i've built a dao which is very sizable of minutes in their day comes for this use case but now i want parallel adjacent use cases i could build extension businesses i could build payments i could build travel i could want to be a larger state of mind or a larger wallet share for that user and that becomes more like an extension framework for a founder and the third becomes a very relevancy framework like for example in this day and age if you're building something like i'm in consumer tech if you're building something in consumer tech and you don't have any element of ai uh, in what you're building then about 5 years later would your business still be as relevant as what it is right now that becomes a question so relevancy is always evolving depending on whether your technology has evolved how are you dealing with cloud how are you dealing with new infrastructure so for a founder i think that's very important and for any business that are you doing a hard pivot is this just an extension or are you doing something to be more relevant with how technologies or trends have changed like people changed from web to mobile in the early 2000s yeah. and i know for a fact that consumer apps or consumer technologies that time which didn't change very quickly like microsoft completely missed the smartphone game and android went into it very fast because they missed the third element of this which was relevancy so they didn't pivot but they could have become very relevant and that's one part of your question i think the second part is very interesting which is pmf uh, and i fully concur uh, over here because i think it's an ever evolving journey for us uh, pmf changed in what would you define as engagement pmf where you could set certain kpis and my only suggestion in that would be that whatever you think your pmf is the only question you need to ask is that if your if you had to grow 10x would still would this pmf still sustain like for example you're acquiring let's say 2000 users every month you're acquiring 5000 10000 and you're getting x retention x engagement x orders i don't know if that would be scalable when you acquire 100000 your cpis could go off the charts your retentions could not sustain if you have a slightly more elastic curve if you have a curve that sort of staying with the kind of user base that is growing then you sort of have pmf at least on one factor and the second thing the true litmus test i think of pmf is revenue pmf and that's something most folks will concur that if you have actual people who are willing to pay for your product and they are willing to come back and pay again then i think you have revenue pmf like we launched monetization this year and we realized that a uh, building for revenue pmf is a whole interesting learning curve and you have to go back to the drawing board build so many things again and realize that 100 things are breaking 10 things are sticking and then you go into this core funnel of what is really relevant in my product and that's all that pmf is about everything else is a frill around it so i think from product to revenue the pmf definition changes and it changes with scale like we were acquiring close to i'll give you a perspective we were acquiring close to about 100000 users a month till i think one and a half years ago and we felt we have pmf now we acquire we have close to about 90 million users and about 3 and a half million new users every month and the definition of pmf has changed completely in the in the company that now it's no longer retention engagement now it's just about how many of these are converting to paid users and what is the paid user retention so that definition has to evolve as long as you are true to your ethos so yeah Rohit, you wanna add? While I'm amazed that a Bangalore founder, consumer tech, doubt, talking revenue, revenue, revenue. ऐसा भी हो रहा है. 
No, so I, I, I sort of, I think, totally uh, agree with that thing, you know, what Ankit and Saurabh have covered, right? Because uh, I'll again break it down in two phases. One, obviously, the PMF thing, which is something I think you have to figure, and that's something we have also seen that it changes at every scale. So, so that definition, you have to keep evolving. Like, as founders, you think, you know, one day, now demand is coming, retention is great, so now, you know, like in the next, say, five, six months, you will just keep growing exponentially every month, and you'll be there. And then you suddenly realize, I think things start to break again, right? So one is obviously product PMF for which you could have different metric. It could be retention uh, for a sector in business. It could be NPS. It could be something else. So that is something you have to obviously keep a track on. Once you have known that there is obviously a demand curve that's shaping up, then the second thing is obviously on the unit economic side. Revenue is obviously one part, but then again, there are 100 ways of driving revenue as well, depending on the business you are in. But is that truly really unit economics shaping in the way I think it should, right? And I think once you have those two things in place, then I think definitely uh, w once you build internal capabilities to capitalize on that, okay, that you have enough tech, you have enough team, you, you have everything in place, now to capitalize on that, I think that's when then you should like take a call and I think really go at it. But, but uh, like I don't think there's any other way to yeah. discover yeah. this I think time and again. So I think uh, next question thoda deep jate. Founder journey, high, low, everyone says, so Instagram pe rose dalte hai, high, low, ek aise graph hai. It's my, it's my favorite DP, right? So tell us the low points, right? Everyone celebrates the highs. Tell us how low, if you can, how low have you actually gone? And then this whole thing of, like, my friend is a businessman. He says, you have an investor, he will tell you, he will tell you. So tell us how important is this investor, mentor, angel, VC, um, in that down? Right. And if you can share some of your experiences of the low uh, which happened, right? Like founder journey is just too glorified sometimes, I feel, right? Like, but the actual struggle, hai, uh, it doesn't come out. See, these two things are separate. <laughs> <laughs> Only investors don't give you lows. <laughs> Let's be clear. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in my case what happened. See, we've been uh, uh, building this business. Today we are sitting at... Uh, uh, close to about 15 million users uh, typically with about 5 million mouths and about half a million DAOs, right? Now from the numbers point of view, that was very good. And most of it is acquired at zero CAC because wow. of our community model. Now, I'm just giving a scenario of with investors and without investors so that you understand. I'm the only founder at Unstop, right? So there were times where I was wanting to have a thought partner to sort of discuss few elements of expansions to take those decisions whether this is right or that is right. I think that's what I found in my set of investors in our board and when we have those logical rational decisions, those are decisions that also make me think beyond what I was thinking earlier. I think because of, I think the exposure, obviously you can't expect at the end of the day, the call needs to be by the founder, but at least if the investors are making you think, that's a good aspect, nothing else, right? Uh, and that's why I think choosing whom you want on your cap table is very, very critical because as a founder, you, at some point in time, you may need only funds to survive. I, I acknowledge tab to jo mile so achha, right? But when you have crossed that stage, I think then we need to choose whether these investors will be able to grow my business together, right? Whether together is crucial or they will only be looking at me that Ankit, you have not grown the business. We don't care. You have to do that. I think that those are the conversation that needs to have. Coming to the second part, I think from the, the low, it happens. It, uh, I mean, there were times where, uh, not not recently, but earlier, where uh, you go into that shell, okay, where you do want to cry, you do want to figure out, yaar, ab main kya karo? and generally that happens, not on a daily basis, but maybe on a I quarterly like, basis, there will be <laughs> downs and yeah. ups or so. But what happens there is that, I can't have the, those emotions coming live when I'm actually in office because yeah. I need to be positive. As a founder, everybody needs to see me only positive. Trust me, 
because that's how you will only be able to give that motivation to the team to the leaders that hey everything is fine no matter what what pressure is coming from the investors or from the outside clients or so only some bit should be passed on it has to be passed on because they also should feel that pressure but whenever you are you are actually down and generally what i do uh, frankly there are times when i go low and i always think through so i share my uh, date of birth with mark zuckerberg exactly same wow. so in a sense uh, brother from another mother right so mai apne dimag mein ye bolta hu that he is doing so much so he is in front of us jury he is handling so many mera to kuch bhi nahi hai so ankit sab theek ho jayega and i think that's how a founder's journey becomes lonely in some ways but you definitely need some thought partners whom you can share this and now that can be your spouse your friends or maybe your investors you need to figure that out but you need to put that out that hey i'm feeling low what should we do unfortunately your your team yeah sh- may i mean in my case it should not be the team because i should not discuss in terms of what are those gray areas and negative areas in the whole business unless and until it is business related yeah. sorry you want to go yeah, yeah. Um, no i think kuch naam to do kisi investor ka jisne help help kiya <laughs> right we should we have this we should get some fun no mai to naam bhi le leta hu matlab my actual most so i'll give you my relationship with my first investor the investor who put our first ever check into the company was with water bridge so the partner from waterbridge knew me from 5 years because we were with flip we were in flipkart together yeah. so i think it's very important to have at least a few investors if not all like we've been very lucky to have a very supportive board but you need to have folks with whom you can honestly brainstorm or riff with right like you can agree to disagree on certain things you can brainstorm on initiatives agar aap unko sirf apni good news bata rahe ho that we've scaled to this much we've got this much revenue then the day things go south they will never be prepared because they'll be like no so far we only knew the good is there something that is not working so in most of my monthly updates i would typically always update saying this is what is going well this is where we failed very badly yeah. and this is what we wanted to do and this is what we want to do in the next quarter because that's a good thinking yeah. model for you in general that be very honest about what's not working but you know i in the spirit of the question of uh lows and this i think look a founder journey is extremely lonely like as a single founder it's even more lonelier like i concur a lot with uh, what ankit said that because uh, you actually feel very low not because of any external circumstance most of the times it's sometimes something as silly as a feature that you really wanted to work but did not work to the extent that you thought it will or for a lot of d2c folks it could be a product line it could be a particular sku that you felt yaar ye tod dega this is going to get me there and it sometimes just doesn't happen for 100 reasons and there but then there will also be something that you felt will bomb completely and it just outshone and everyone loved it so there's those highs that get balanced with the lows and vice versa but i truly believe that a company's culture starts and stops with a lot in a lot of cases with the founder so paul graham from yc recently wrote about something yeah. it's called the yeah. founder mode yeah. where he said that uh, run a company in the way that you want to run it don't just give it to like 10 managers to say i won't micromanage i won't get into this i'll operate at a very high level and it just spoke very clearly to me because it validates a lot of you know uh shoulders on just go in fully and uh go deep into certain things but i truly believe that a company's culture even for every spirit gets started with the founder so if you're the first one in and the last one out that typically would mean like a 17 18 hour work day yeah. and over a period of time like i don't remember taking a holiday in the last three and a half years wow. so one if that happens to your life then you have to be prepared for that journey i mean if you're prepared for that struggle if you're prepared for that then itna lonely nahi lagega you won't feel those lows and sometimes like i can't even take it back and discuss these problems with family or spouse because they won't understand yeah. that okay why are you anybody would say okay why are you even building this then just relax i think the best people sometimes to discuss this with at least from my experience what i found is that if you have a very good founding team like your original founding members who are with you from your day zero Yeah. like i happen to have a lot of those folks 
which uh, very famously, right, uh, I read about his case study at Apple once, where Steve Jobs would do a retreat with only those folks from Apple who he said are people who matter the most. And that's a very bold move, right? Like out of 1,000 people, he's taking 40 people on retreat saying, I want to brainstorm only with these guys because they are the ones who matter. So for me, it was my founding team with whom I will debate and say that this is what I feel low about, this is what I feel is not working. Uh, it could be something as stupid as, you know, people are not coming on time. <laughs> and that could also be something that a founder could feel low about that, yeah, yeah discipline has gone fully off, this remote working, how do we manage with all of this? <laughs> but all those are real problems which you can confide with people who you relate sure. to. And that's the way I have at least dealt with yeah. this. Yeah, just wanted to add one point. I think what I did and just giving you clear cut. So when we were forming our board, so whenever you sign those SHAs, agreements or so, uh, a board, I mean, we decide who will be on the board based on the percentage that they are getting after receiving the funds. Simple, right? I chose a person who was investing. He was only a, not a majority stake, but I wanted that person to be on the board only because he was a founder himself. Because what happens is when in those board meetings, the discussions are happening, you may want a person who has run a company to be on your side because, see, the point is there will be rational discussions, but those emotions that as a founder you may go through, that a founder would understand rather than an investor. And those decisions might just be that, hey, I need a better team or I can't fire my team no matter what they do because they have been with me for ages. Yeah. I think those are certain aspects yeah. that we need to be sure about and it can be a board seat or an observer seat but at least if there is one person or maybe more alongside who understands your journey and your emotions yeah. that's better than a pure play investor. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, we have the last question from me for all three of you. Um, so if today, Rohit, and this is for all of you, uh, if you were to start all over again today, uh, what would you build? Uh, what sector, what's that hot sector where VCs are lining up outside our house and saying, se paise le lo, or just something that you resonate with, right? Like you think this is the future. Right, so, I mean, if you only want to look at what VCs are lying, <laughs> lining up for, obviously some of those sectors are very, very clear, right? AI is the hottest and there are obviously others. Profitable now, no? Profit. it has to be. I think, so, so, so that's the thing, right? I think with the VCs, I feel, I think that always moves in cycles, right? Today, everyone is talking about profitability. Couple of years back, all of us know what sort of models were funded and were called visionary and today, like, no one is obviously, you know, I mean, like, even paying attention to them, right? So things will move in cycles. As an entrepreneur, you have to play a long game. In fact, for India, I think the game is generally even longer because I think that the country is building and I think a lot of these things are happening over time. Good thing is at least now I think we are in that phase 2.0 where you are seeing exits happening, other things also building up to like, you know, sort of profitable and scalable in a sustainable manner. So that sort of maturity is coming. But in any case, as an entrepreneur, like if you think, okay, you know, tomorrow I'll start this and in the next three years, this will, you know, go who has taken, then I'll just um, uh, retire and chill, right? That's definitely not happening. So you have to trade across cycles. And for that, you have to be prepared to go to a space which you really, really like. And as I said, I think early on, right, that have a very long-term view on. Okay, this is something which will work, does make sense to me, I want to stick in it, maybe I'll learn, I'll grow, I'll enjoy it as a part of the process. Otherwise, the lows will always, I think, catch you if you're only going into it because it's hot today. Because tomorrow when it's not, then definitely you don't have any extra passion to really continue into it, right? So even when we choose FinTech, uh, you know, I think uh, almost seven, eight years back, I think that was my thinking around it, that India is in a place where financial service, like if you have to grow to a $7 trillion, $10 trillion economy, obviously fundamental sectors have to uh, make sure that base is covered, right? And financial services is one such market. The great thing is with all the innovations that have kept happening, you know, uh, not just technology side, say, but even from the government side. So starting with our India stack, then UPI, and now we obviously hear about ONDC, OK, and uh, ULI. So there's obviously a lot of phenomenal work happening and I think we have barely scratched the surface, right? So obviously payments have done certain things. There's obviously certain thing which has happened on consumer and MSME lending, but now I think secured lending is getting more interesting. Over time people want to, I think, you know, will want to manage their entire financial health. How does that happen? Frauds are rising, problem statements are changing. How do you take care of that? So in my view, 
uh, like at least if you ask me, I would again build for the same space. Uh, problem statements could be somewhat different, but I really think I think over the next two, three decades, you will keep seeing, I think, very, very fundamental transformations happening. And if you stick to it, it's a massive market. If you pick your niche right, ultimately, you will create a horizontal play. You will tackle each and every problem for your customer. So there's a lot to do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, of course, apart from that, if you have to pick a space, I think AI is something which is, again, fundamentally changing everything. There are certain obvious sectors which have already, I think, you know, uh, been uh, getting, taking advantage of it. For the others, people are still figuring. So, so, so obviously, th there's a lot to do there. Climate is obviously another interesting so thing. AI, which is climate about. is what I heard. Could be, okay. yeah. I think very, very okay. interesting. Climate plus AI plus fintech, okay. yeah. I yeah, think. let's come to Saurabh. Yeah, no, I think uh, any space which has become obvious where VCs are investing is already too late for people to enter, in Good my point. view, yeah. because uh, there's something that I believe that the riches are in the niches, that yeah. If you pick up a space which you find very interesting and it's not become very obvious to everyone, then you can build that and you can grow your market very considerably because you've identified something. So, I mean, now suddenly a lot of these plays have become very obvious. So, you'll see a lot of red oceans there, you'll see a lot of competition, etc. coming in. But uh, just to sort of get to, uh, it's a very interesting question that if you had to build all over again, uh, what would you build, right? I feel that I would be doing a lot of injustice to my own self if I felt that I wouldn't be only building Elo Elo, right? Because I feel that the space that you pick has to be a combination of your problem statement or your passion area. Like I used to do stand-up comedy and theater at a point in time. So for me, creator economy was a passion area where I said, yeah, this is karna entertainment. Hai. India could have its own YouTube at a point yeah. in time and Elo Elo could potentially become that. So for us, the entertainment opportunity was massive. And second is, I think if you're able to deliver value, uh, then you can build a lot of things within this use case. Like for example, a lot of problem statements people don't talk about is that loneliness is a very large problem. Many other problem statements are growing. So within the entertainment ambit, I think I would build consistently and add newer and newer problem statements here. So that framework. Ankit, you want to add anything quickly before we... I mean, uh, mine will be a bit uh, contradicted to what people may want to hear. Uh, generally, I've seen two sectors which will always be evergreen because I've no, not heard too many hospitals getting closed and primary schools getting closed. The colleges are many getting closed, right? All the ed techs who have raised funds are going offline now because I, I believe there is money and there is investable models even offline if done well so hypothetically any hospital you take up right maybe the idea is that how can we make it more affordable if somebody can crack it and go berserk on every city in india and every possibly multiple whether tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 because healthcare penetration is very very minimal but people are not doing it because it requires huge amount of capital, yep. which not everybody will be able to sort of get in terms of the money or so. But I, I believe primary education, opening up schools and opening up hospitals is the basic should, should, should be good. Yeah. Thank you so much, gentlemen. This has been super helpful. Uh, I think all of us have loved it. I'm sorry we don't get out of time for questions, but anyone has any questions, feel free to catch the speakers here. They'll be here for a cup of coffee at least. Thank you.